some of them are arguing for an indigenous Islamic route to human rights principles. And there are those who argue that the reason why the Saudi Arabian monarchy has come down so hard on them is because they see this argument as a threat. You know, we, we got arrested, not for the sake of getting arrested, but for the sake of standing up, saying, no, when you're right. No, when you're right. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is shown on over 30 cable stations from Vermont to New York City on the internet at thestruggle.org, our YouTube channel, Struggle Video Media. Today, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Syria, and Pastor Anthony Bennett talking about confronting racism. First, Sunjeev Berry of Amnesty International on the crackdown on civil society in Saudi Arabia and the Saudi U.S. attack on Yemen. So first of all, the crackdown on civil society in Saudi Arabia. I mean, many people are already, here are already well aware of this, um, and there are people who have spoken today who are in direct contact with or directly related to people who are, who are right now suffering in, 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 uh, and uh, living day to day in Saudi Arabian prisons. The name Raif Badawi, of course, is one that many people know, the Saudi Arabian blogger, to 10 years in prison, uh, 1,000 lashes. Many people may also know the name of his lawyer, Walid al -Wakher, a man who is a, a human rights advocate and, and lawyer in Saudi Arabia, 15-year prison sentence. And then, of course, there are the many people that Walid al -Wakher is part of a community of in terms of human rights advocates in Saudi Arabia. Uh, some of whom are under an organization that in English is spelled ACPRA, the Association for Civil and Political Rights in Saudi Arabia. All of the leaders of ACPRA today are in prison or are facing criminal charges or have been detained. And we're talking long, multi-year sentences. This is a full throttle crackdown on anyone who dares to uh, advocate for human rights in Saudi Arabia. One of the particular things to keep in mind with regards to many of the individuals from this community uh, of ACPRA and those who work with them is that some of them have, have made the argument within Saudi Arabia that human rights are uh, Islamically derived. They come from the Quran, they come from Islamic doctrine, and they're making an argument for the, the roots of human rights that is sometimes different than the arguments that organizations like Amnesty International might make, that people in Western universities might make, that those from the Western legal canon might make in terms of international law, international treaties, etc. They are arguing for an indigenous, some of them are arguing for an indigenous Islamic route to human rights principles. And there are those who argue that the reason why the Saudi Arabian monarchy has come down so hard on them is because they see this argument as a threat. And so when you hear those in potentially Islamic, Islamophobic discourse in the United States say things like, where are the Muslim reformers? Well, a major ally of the United States has put them in prison. And it's something to think about, you know, as, as we elevate the arguments of how we can be sophisticated and thoughtful in our solidarity with those who are struggling as we seek to make sure our own government does not do damage along the way. So that's one thing to think about in terms of this crackdown on civil society. Another is in the, what are called these so-called counter-terrorism counter courts, these specialized criminal courts that we've heard of. Uh, these are some of the courts that are established in the context of Saudi Arabia's so-called cooperation in the, in the so-called crackdown on terrorism, something that Western governments, including the U.S. government, have often praised. Um, and these courts are used frequently to criminalize peaceful, nonviolent dissent. Walid Abu Akher, the human rights lawyer facing the, with the 15-year prison sentence, convicted in one of the specialized criminal courts. So when you hear this sort of rebuttal, well, we need Saudi Arabia's government to be an ally in the war on terror, they are manipulating this language and using it to criminalize legitimate dissent inside the country and put people in jail for many, many years on end. It goes beyond this. In Saudi Arabia, all public gatherings, including peaceful demonstrations, are prohibited under an order by the Ministry of the Interior in 2011. In November of 2015, uh, the government established a law of associations. You could say, you know, at the most charitable level, their version of a nonprofit law, except for these factors. It, it excludes any mention of human rights. Uh, the government has the power to deny licenses to new organizations and to disband them if deemed to be, quote, harming national unity, end quote. So these are the ways in which the laws have been established to further support this crackdown on civil society voices. 
And not only that, but as I mentioned before, authorities continue to ban independent human rights associations and imprison founding members, as with the membership and the leadership of ACPRA. So this, this covers some of the many ways in which the Saudi Arabian monarchy and its institutions and government uh, shut down independent domestic voices that are calling for reforms in, in ways that, that resonate within Saudi Arabian society. Many of the people involved in the, these communities are, are very well liked and popular within the country. Uh, they have many Twitter followers, they're followed widely, their ideas resonate and they've been put in prison. I also want to take a moment to, to shift to another set of human rights violations uh, that are quite egregious that the Saudi Arabian government is involved in with the backing of the United States. And this is in the context of the Saudi Arabian government and military-led coalition attacks in Yemen. This is an air war that the Saudi Arabian government and its partners have launched um, in Yemen in response to or following a Yemeni political faction, the Houthis, sweeping through Yemen and kicking out the prior government that was Saudi Arabia backed. Fine, political conflict, potentially civil war, but here's what happened with the Saudi Arabian government's uh, air war as a consequence. Um, they declared an entire government or province of Yemen, the Salah province, a military target. No differentiation between military targets or uh, civilians. Homes, hospitals, schools bombed. Amnesty International staff, some of my colleagues were on the ground there, you know, watching and warily as, you know, they were watching the Saudi planes above uh, as they were moving through parts of the country documenting the violations on the ground. The consequence of this conflict is that, you know, over the past year or more, 35,000 people have been killed in Yemen. Uh, in less than a year, more than two and a half million people have lost their homes. This is a vast, vast uh, amount of damage and destruction to, to have happened. And, and if it weren't for potentially Western media fatigue and, and, and Western audiences fatigue, we would know so much more about this. Unfortunately, there's so many other tragedies happening right now as well in the context of Syria, etc., that most people don't even know. But here's the, here's the crazy thing. Even as the Saudi Arabian uh, government and its Gulf, Gulf national allies across the Gulf states have been waging this war, the United States, under the Obama administration, approved a $1.2 billion bomb sale to the Saudi Arabian government with thousands of bombs and warheads that would essentially replenish their stocks. This is happening right now. These the, the, the arms sale has been approved, the manufacturing process is beginning, and while it will take some time for those bombs to get to Saudi Arabia, the reality is that when a government is engaged in this kind of full throttle bombardment uh, of a neighboring country and it knows that the United States is going to replenish its stocks, there, there is no pressure to, to change the behavior of the government in terms of the mass bombardment. It's a green light for whatever the claims are of the U.S. government otherwise. The, the coalition's airstrikes have killed and injured thousands of civilians, uh, destroyed civilian homes and infrastructure. Uh, including hospitals, schools, markets, and factories. Uh, and they even targeted civilian and humanitarian assistance vehicles and, of course, made a humanitarian, uh, dire humanitarian situation in Yemen even worse. And one of the interesting things is that there is, there's no hiding the, the U.S. government's role in this. I just went yesterday to state.gov, the U.S. State Department's website. I searched Saudi Arabia, comma, arms sale. And then here comes the statement I was looking for from March 1st, just a couple days ago, where the U.S. government clearly states Saudi Arabia is the United States' largest foreign military sales customer with nearly $100 billion in active foreign military sales cases. In November 2015, the U.S. approved a possible foreign military sale case to Saudi Arabia uh, for an estimated cost of $1.29 billion. This is just in broad daylight. You know, this is not something that's being hidden. This is, this is being made easily public. So given all of this, and I want to leave some time for questions, um, you know, what have critics in, in, uh, attempted to do? First, um, members of Congress at different points in time have, been, have, have rallied in different ways to challenge various aspects of Saudi Arabian human rights. Of course, they haven't done so in the context of the arms sale. Very few have done so in the context of the arms sales, which shows to you what happens when American military sales and profits are on the table. But in 2014, some 50 members of Congress, through uh, lobbying and, and grassroots pressure and a, a coalition of organizations, sent a letter to President Obama uh, urging him to stand up for a whole range of human rights issues when he visited Riyadh, Saudi Arabia in 2014. Eight senators signed a letter to King Salman uh, regarding Raif Badawi and Walid Abu al cases. 
Another 67 members of Congress signed a letter last year to King Salman. Uh, and all of this happened because a, a cross-section of voices came together, human rights advocates, uh, advocates uh, for women's human rights, but also people being willing to reach across traditional ideological boundaries, as have been alluded to earlier today, uh, so that those who are advocates for uh, religious minorities' freedoms, um, in particularly in the United States in the context of Christian organizations, also came on board. There are very few strong ideological allies within the American grassroots with the behavior of the Saudi Arabian government. They're waiting, it's wait, they're, people are waiting for a substantive strong challenge. And people in this room have an opportunity over the next couple of days to come up with some of the potential vehicles for this so that those 50 members of Congress, those 60 members of Congress can be made to not just sign statements or, or letters, which can be helpful, but to also cut off the arms sales and then to go from there. You see? Arms sales that are not just devastating life in Yemen, but can also be used by internal police and security forces inside Saudi Arabia when they arrest somebody, when they, when they take a woman who's attempting to drive and put her in jail, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and to provide people with the kind of vehicles that are necessary politically to make these challenges possible. Uh, and I think folks in this room have a really unique opportunity from a place of, of, of principled advocacy to reach out into different communities in the United States who are politicized in different ways. Those who might care from a, a religious perspective about the religious freedom of Christian minorities who are uh, Filipino laborers in Saudi Arabia who might not be allowed to practice. Those who are strong advocates for women's human rights and, and can be helped in terms of uh, playing strong solidarity roles as opposed to sort of what might be called saviorism, if that makes sense. Um, folks who are you know, advocates for freedom of speech there are a lot of different ways to do this. There are challenges that can be put to American companies. Are you enforcing Saudi human rights violations in your workplace? Are you handing over Wi-Fi data in Saudi Arabia? Are you, um, as Sharat has already spoken to, you know, are, are you enforcing unjust labor laws? Do you care if uh, Saudi women are able to drive the cars that you're selling in Saudi Arabia or not? There are a whole host of opportunities to be brainstormed. And once these opportunities are brought forward, uh, my personal feeling is that there will be an eruption of political solidarity and support that will challenge the status quo. And I think folks here in this room have a unique opportunity to play in, in getting that started. So thank you. Now a Code Pink video about Ali Al-Nimr that's been viewed on Facebook over one million times. Here, Ali McCracken of Code Pink tries to talk to the head of the Armed Services Committee about Saudi Arabia. So you're okay with all those things? That's too bad, sir. It's time to get out of bed with Saudi Arabia, Congressman. It's obvious that this so-called public servant holds Ali and all of us 
in utter contempt. We have to admit that so far we failed. We failed to help the victims of the Saudi royals, despite all the disruptions and the videos and the petitions and the critical articles in the New York Times and the statements by Senator Murphy. Obama went to Saudi Arabia and visited only the king. He didn't talk to the Al-Nimr family or any of the families of the dissidents rotting in the Saudi jails. He issued no public statements other than, than the usual boilerplate about undying U.S. friendship for the hereditary tyrants. We have much work to do. These are photos of some of the Syrian white helmets. They're volunteers who dig people out of the rubble after bombings and shellings. By their reckoning, they've helped some 40,000 people. Five of them were killed by Assad forces on April 26th. Then a few days later, this hospital in Aleppo was bombed by Assad or Putin airplanes, 55 dead, including the last pediatrician in the liberated areas of Aleppo. The same week, the reporter Seymour Hirsch was on Democracy Now! claiming that charges by Syrians that Assad forces had killed 1,300 by sarin gas some years ago was a blood lie. There's a petition campaign going around asking Democracy Now! to allow Syrians to be interviewed on the program to answer this astounding defense of Assad. You can see links to it on our website, thestruggle.org. Now a very brief tribute to Hedy Epstein. She's a 90-year-old activist who's gotten some very bad medical news. She was a refugee from Nazi Germany. In her 80s, she started helping Palestinians try to go on some of the boats to Gaza. She also took parts in protests over Ferguson and was arrested in her hometown of St. Louis. There's a Facebook page in her honor. Please visit it. Now, Anthony Bennett, senior pastor at Mount Airy Baptist Church in Bridgeport, Connecticut. He spoke with Bishop John Selders in a revolutionary conversation confronting racism. Here he talks about an incredible example of white privilege. Last year we had a conversation right after the uh, massacre, right after the massacre. And uh, we held uh, a conversation. And because I'm in Bridgeport, um, I don't get too many white partners. Because generally, white people don't want to talk about race. They want me to talk about it. And, and I'm tired of talking about it, because it ain't my problem. I'm the collateral damage Hello. Um, mm -hmm. of, of, white, of white people's issues. And I've got to wrestle with it. And so when we had this conversation, and so you see, see I mean, you see, you, you. I'm <laughs> thankful. I'm thankful that you're hosting this. Um, on that night, one uh, wonderful woman, Martha Council, was a retired mathematical teacher. Uh, in Bridgeport Public School System. You know her, you know her. Yeah, she and her husband, uh, Ralph Council, wonderful educators. Uh, they, they, they really should be here. They could really share stories. We had a little bit more than 100, 125 people. Uh, Bishop and Sister Selders were there. And we were talking about race. There were a few white people there who basically talked to us about the burden of white privilege. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and after she, after she, after he spoke, it was it was sincere. I mean, you know, it was sincere. I think. <laughs> right. She got up and said, you know, not the Trumpian kind of approach to white privilege. But for her, white privilege was shooting nine people and then being stopped a while later and being politely asked to get out of your car. After you murdering nine people. And then the highlight of privilege, she said, this woman who's from South Carolina, this woman who has experience every day of dealing with white privilege. She said, white privilege is being escorted on your way to the police station and being able to stop by Burger King for a burger. In this section, he talks about how he, a minister, accepted arrest. It was uh, Moral Mondays was doing their um, rally and protest. And a couple of our, myself and a couple of the associate ministers from our church went up. Um, I did not have the intention of getting arrested that day. Um, and yet, when I saw my brother on the line, my sister on the line, and I looked around and I saw more white people <laughs> in the line to get arrested, and a lot of my other Baptists and black brothers and sisters weren't there, I said, no, I cannot allow my brother, if he's gonna be my friend, it's not, not just now, but if he's my, if my brother, I'm not gonna let him go down there by himself. And so I called my wife, babe, I gotta do this. She's like, all right, do what you gotta do. She's a revolutionary too. Do what you gotta do. And um, one of the brothers, one, one of the two associate businesses, they were ready to go. The other one wasn't ready to go. He wasn't ready to go. And so, and so you know, we, we got arrested, not for the sake of getting arrested, but for the sake of standing up, saying, no, when you're right. No, when you're right. Um, we were released. We had a chance to minister in that holding cell with some of the young brothers who just got caught up. All right, so it was a blessing for us um, um, to do some internal ministry. Um, got out, came out, everything was going. I'm, I'm talking, I'm trying to make the picture. I'm talking about my mom. Yeah, they need to know about the mom. So my mother, and my mother and father from Wyoming, Mississippi. Yes, Lord. Country. country. Uh, town grew up where you had to walk out, you had to get off the sidewalk. Didn't share a whole lot of my own personal story, but my father got shot when I was 11, 10 or 11 in South Central Los Angeles where I live. Grew up and we had a corner house. It wasn't for a fence, he would have died. Um, so I was trying to, trying to take his stuff. Um, as a younger child, I would speak out against something. And for them, again, the way white supremacy, white privilege works is they actually got on me because my mother and father knew what or what I didn't know growing up there that oftentimes the majority of African American families, they wrestled, sort of like that movie Crash. Do I want you alive and, and, and holding your tongue or do I want you brave and dead? Yeah. And so a lot of times, you know, parent right, wrong, or different, they chose to, they chose to. So, so that's the sort of background of my parents. Um, who did well, made made less money than anything, uh, less than 20000 in Los Angeles, South Central Los Angeles, but sent all of their children um, to college and university, UC Berkeley, UCLA, and Morehouse, the best school in the <laughs> world, right? But, wow. But still, in their mind, white privilege was still the standard, so to speak. So once I got arrested, after I got arrested, um, and because of Facebook, um, it was on. It was on. It was on Facebook. <laughs> All right. You can't hide nothing. And before I was able to let my mother know, this is 
Monday. So I talked to her on the following, on that Sunday. And I, I said, Mama, how you doing? She said, I'm not doing well. I said, why you not doing well, Mama? Because my son got arrested. <laughs> And, and again, we got arrested a few years ago when you said I get a jail for their the union workers. You got arrested again. She said, your daddy wanted you to work in the community, but he had no intention of you getting arrested. I said, mama, yeah, but uh, we are all right. She said, no, I'm not all right. I'm not all right. You shouldn't do the you know, southern draw, so you can imagine, southern draw. She said, well, you know, what, what you gonna tell your congregation? You got arrested. You supposed to be a preacher. I said, Mama, the congregation gave me a standing ovation because they understood. She said, what you gonna tell, what you gonna tell your, your son? Your son is in school. I said, Mama, they were studying. This is all in the church. We had a conversation on my way up to preach in Waterbury at that following Sunday. I said, she said, I said, Mama, his school was studying protests and civil rights, and, and so he was able to show a clipping of his daddy, you know, getting arrested for a And then she said, and they said, well, well, I said, you a preacher. She said, you a preacher. You're not supposed to, you're supposed to be civil. You're not supposed to. I said, Mama, Reverend Dr. King, he was a preacher. He got arrested. And she said, that didn't make no difference. <laughs> I knew I couldn't win. I was done. I couldn't win. I couldn't win. I couldn't win. I couldn't win. All right. Fast forward the next week, the situation happened in Ferber. I mean, in, uh, in Char uh, Charleston. Mm -hmm. So That's I, right. you know, I talked to my mother. Right. It was the next week. All this stuff was popping off last year, and um, I called my mother. I said, "Hey, ma, how you doing? Um, uh, are you in Charleston?" <laughs> I said, no, Mom, I'm not in Charleston. She said, I saw somebody climbing up the flag to take down the flag. I didn't know if that was you or not. See his whole talk in our YouTube section on the website, The Struggle. That's our program for today. I'm Stanley Heller for The Struggle.